We have been in a series for several weeks now about biblical reconciliation, and I'm excited today to wrap that series up. And we've been talking about some things that are kind of hard to do, not easy to live out all the time, but are so prevalent if we want to see our relationships be everything God created them to be. We've been talking about forgiveness, talking about repentance restitution, all of these ways that we make reconciliation, not in our relationship with God, because that's something he's done for us through Christ, right? But we've talked about how that vertical relationship starts to work out now horizontally as we walk with each other. So we've talked about these things that are hard, yes, but can absolutely, as we as Christians, model them change our lives. So today, we're going to wrap this series up in a little bit different kind of way. I'm going to try to answer some of your questions. As we've gone through this series, a lot of questions have been answered, but some more have come up. So since this is kind of the bow to wrap this series up, knowing that not everything can be said, and I can't answer every single question, we gave you a chance this week to send in questions that you have about this whole reconciliation process. So what I'm gonna try to do in the next few minutes is answer some questions that came from you guys and some things that maybe need a little bit further clarification. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and get it out. We're still gonna be in the Word because how many of you know everything that we're talking about here is coming from the Word of God. Now, one of the things that makes this unique again is there's nothing in the Bible that says When you want to reconcile with this person, when this issue happens, here's exactly how you need to ask for forgiveness. This is how they need to repent. And this is what terms of restitution look like, and then you'll be good. There's only a few examples in the Old Testament of specific things, but there's principles we use and we draw from so we can apply those to our lives, right? Right? Right. So what we're going to do today is use biblical wisdom in answering some of your questions that you submitted to us. And may the Lord lead us. Holy Spirit, guide my words. Keep me from saying anything I don't need to say. And if there's things I just need to say boldly, help me to do so without an attitude. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm just going to jump right in. You can take notes if you'd like in your app or right there in your Bible. We're going to start with question number one. Is reconciliation necessary for a relationship is necessary right there a key word yes it is let's see it one more time is reconciliation necessary for a relationship no not if you don't mind if your relationship is terrible if you're okay with unhealthy relationships then reconciliation is not necessary. When it comes to relationships, you have many options. You could have codependency. You could have abusive. There are many different things and different styles of relationships you could get into. But if you want to have a healthy, godly relationship, reconciliation is necessary where sin has occurred between two parties. Otherwise, there is always something underneath that surface that's not being dealt with, that's keeping that real relationship that God has intended for you, a healthy one, from happening. So that's my easy first answer. Is it necessary? Not if you don't want an unhealthy relationship. I mean, do what you want. But if you want a godly A healthy relationship, yes, absolutely. Reconciliation, absolutely necessary. I threw up a softball first. Let's go to the next one. This is a two-parter. Who starts the process of forgiveness conversation? And then who starts the process of reconciliation conversation? So kind of a part A and B. This person asks two questions. Let's address them one at a time. Let's do the first one first. Who starts the process of forgiveness conversation. Forgiveness is not a process. It's a decision. So we need to alleviate that confusion right out of the gate. Forgiveness is not a process. So there's no process of forgiveness conversation to be had. Forgiveness is a decision. Now, would it be nice if a conversation happens when somebody has sinned against you? Absolutely. 
Would it be nice if the one who offended you came to you and apologized first and said, would you please forgive me? I repent. Absolutely. But neither of those things are necessary for forgiveness to actually happen between a victim and a perpetrator. Not necessary. There needs to be no conversation. There needs to be no process. Forgiveness is a decision. And it's a decision as Christians that's based out of our position with our Father. Because we're now forgiven because of the blood of Christ shed for us. So since we've been forgiven, we now have made up our minds in following Jesus and doing what he says. We make the decision to forgive others. All right, that's part A. Part B, who starts the process of reconciliation conversation? Who should initiate it? This one's easy too. You. You should initiate the process of reconciliation conversation. As a Christian, it is on you to walk out the commands that God has given you in his word. Well, I was the perpetrator here. Should I be the one to start it? Well, I was the one that's the victim here. Should I start the conversation? Yes. Both. It can go both ways. As a Christian, you are expected to forgive people when they sin against you. As a Christian, you are also expected to repent when you have sinned against another person. As Christians in the Bible, we have no license biblically to wait in our corner while the other person makes the first move. It's not there. It can go both ways. So again, would it be nice if the offender started the process by recognizing they'd done wrong and coming to you and sincerely apologizing and repenting and showing that they're genuine? Absolutely. Would it also be nice if the person who has done the um, or suffered the offense, went to the one who sinned against them and said, hey, you may not even realize you did something here because how many of you know that happens sometimes? You may not even know that you sinned against me here, but I wanted to bring this to you because I don't want to harbor unforgiveness in my heart and resentment and this, and now there be something between us and you didn't even know it. So I'm going to come to you and tell you this is what's gone on. We probably need to talk about it. And then here's kind of what I'm thinking to make things right. What, what do you think about this? Both are good. Either can happen. The victim or the perpetrator in any situation can be the one that initiates the conversation. But as a Christian, my encouragement to you guys is to be the one that as in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called sons of God, I would encourage you to be the one to step into it first, no matter if they're wanting to engage that conversation or not, because blessed are the peacemakers. Where there exists no peace, somebody has to step into the gap to make it start happening. Amen? All right. We're just going to roll right around. This is question number three. We're going to take this one a little deeper. What about when I've reconciled with somebody, but I'm still hurt? And my heart hasn't caught up to my decision to forgive. Hmm. Such a great question. One more time. What about when I've reconciled with somebody? The process has happened, but I'm still hurt. And my heart hasn't caught up to my decision to forgive them. Such a great question. I love even the wording of this question because this person, I believe, must realize that for reconciliation to take place does not necessarily mean that it feels good. I feel like they must realize that even by the way they worded it because reconciliation is bringing peace where there was hostility does not necessarily mean that I feel good about it. That it feels nice and 
It's the left feet. Again. See, reconciliation doesn't necessarily mean our emotions are on this high. It's a common misconception. And we need to pop that misconception so you're not walking this out and then you're wondering, why am I still hurting? Am I crazy? Did I not do this right? No, reconciliation doesn't necessarily mean you feel great. It doesn't necessarily mean that the same trust is there as before. It doesn't necessarily mean that those feelings will come back that you had with that person prior to the sin happening or that, quite honestly, they'll ever come back in the way that it was there before. Now, are those things possible? Absolutely. I've seen it. I've experienced it firsthand. I've seen it in so many situations. But are they required for reconciliation to happen? No. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. This is God speaking. He says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I mean, these are God's words. God speaking. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Your heart can lead you astray. Your emotions can lead you astray. I mean, the heart's deceitful. That's what it says. It's desperately sick. Maybe your version says desperately wicked or beyond cure. But whatever the wording is in your version, it it gets across the message, right? The heart can do some things to us. So why then, if that's the case with our hearts, would we base our perception of a reconciliation process being successful on our feelings. If the heart's so wicked, if it's so deceitful, why do we place so much emphasis on, have I really reconciled? Have I really forgiven them? Why do we base so much in how we feel about it? Because if I remember my Bible right, forgiveness is a decision, right? Forgiveness is a decision. And repentance is a decision, one that has accompanying action with it. So if I want to see if repentance is genuine, I don't necessarily only look at their sincere apology, but I look at what comes with it, what's being walked out. I need to see measurable action, right? That demonstrates to repentance. But these emotions are so subjective as opposed to These terms of restitution we've talked about, these are objective, totally measurable, as opposed to emotions and feelings that are a little harder to measure. Like, oh, I'm I'm feeling good right now. We've reconciled. I'm feeling like we got some hope. The next moment I can feel down. The next moment I'm up again. The next moment I'm down, right? They're harder to measure these feelings that we have. So, for example, you make terms of restitution. It's different than me uh, saying, hey, as part of our terms of restitution for us being right now, I'm not going to yell anymore. I'm going to quit raising my voice. Or you say, I'm going to delete all that porn off all my devices as part of our relationship being right again. Or we say, we're now going to have mutual accountability between us. That's part of our reconciliation process. Those are terms we can agree to and we can measure. We can see if we're living up to those. But if I'm going by only how I feel about it or how you feel about it, can you see how it can be deceptive and subjective and fleeting? Emotions come and go. It says the heart's deceptive. It's desperately sick. But it's also good to note here that your emotions are real. Turn to somebody and say, it's okay to feel. Turn to somebody else, Mario. (laughs) Tell them it's okay to feel. It's okay. It's okay to feel. No, your emotions are real. And that needs to be acknowledged. Because to just absolutely ignore everything in us is not healthy either. We need to acknowledge emotions for what they are. We need to deal with them for what they are, but it's a whole other thing to make all of our decisions 
and our lives be based upon these fleeting, very possibly deceptive feelings. So it's similarly unwise to base the success of a reconciliation process upon how I feel about it or how I feel in any given moment. Because again, how we, we reconciled. I feel it's so good. And now I go home and I'm playing the process out in my head and I'm thinking back through the conversation and now I'm feeling, oh, again, but am I really reconciled with this person? Did they really show repentance? See, if you find yourself feeling these things, if you find yourself hurting and you've already reconciled, if you feel like your heart's not caught up to that decision you made to forgive, first, I just need you to realize that's perfectly normal. Turn to somebody and say, you can be normal. I mean, it don't mean they are normal. I don't know who you're talking to. But having those feelings are perfectly normal. You're not crazy. You're not a bad Christian. You're not not doing enough because you don't feel it right now. No, this is perfectly normal because you're a human and you have emotions. You know, one of the things that didn't change about me when I started following Jesus is I didn't just quit feeling things. It didn't happen. You know, pre-Jesus, I felt things like anger, um, rage, uh, happiness. I laughed a lot. I felt jealousy. You know, the kind of things I still felt after I started walking with Jesus? Anger, rage, happiness, joy jealousy. Feelings don't define us. We have them. They're part of our makeup as a person, but they should not dictate our course of life or our decisions, but they also can't be completely ignored, y'all. They're there for a reason. I, I, I have a hard time believing that God wants a bunch of passionless robots walking around being like, what should we do in this situation? How should I handle this person? Like, I don't think God wants that. I think God wants people that have subjected their emotions to the word. I think God wants a people who can put their emotions in their right place. But like personally, even like in worship or reading the word or just doing my life with the Lord, I love it when I can feel his presence tangibly. Like I love that kind of stuff. I love it when I get to see like my own kids and the joy it brings me when they're actually not fighting and having a good time together and hanging out and just all of these things that are good about life that God has given to us. He doesn't want you to not feel. And you're not wrong for feeling something. It's where you put those things. The Bible says the heart is deceptive. See, I think it's important, again, that we really press into one more time this definition that we've been using for reconciliation and defining again and understanding what it is and what it is not. Reconciliation, at least part of that definition we've been using, is bringing accord out of discord. Where there was hostility between two parties, now there's been a bringing back together. There's peace. So where there was hostility, now there is peace. But peace does not necessarily entail feelings of happiness. Peace does not necessarily entail trust. Peace doesn't necessarily entail everything goes back to normal and it's hunky-dory again. That's not what peace means. Peace can foster these things but it does not require that those things are there. And for me personally, guys, this is probably my biggest takeaway from this whole series. As I went in and personally have been into this really hard and productive and amazing study I've done for the past six, seven weeks, this is my biggest takeaway. Before this study, I had this idea of reconciliation as two people are mad at each other, they have hurt each other in the worst of ways, and then they come back together, and they're desperately in love again, and everything's better than it used to be, because now they persevered, and it's even better than it started before sin happened, and everything's amazing. But that's not what reconciliation is, at least not every time, not all the time. 
In fact, oftentimes what reconciliation looks like is there has been sin happen, we've addressed it, we've gotten to peace, and it never goes further. It can look like restoration completely with feelings and everything's back to normal and everything's as it used to be, but that's not what reconciliation is biblically. Reconciliation is bringing peace where there was no peace. It doesn't always look like a fairy tale. And that was a huge breakthrough for me. Reconciliation can look different ways. It doesn't always look like we're at odds and now we're great and I feel the same way about you that I did before. And actually it's even better now. It's not always the case. And if we can look at this realistically and biblically, we can walk this out not feeling so defeated. Why why do I feel this way? Like this person asked, why do I not feel good now? I've reconciled. I made my decision. I forgave them. God, you told me to forgive them. I forgave them, but I still don't feel good about it. I still can't trust them or I still can't look at them the same way. Why is it? It's because you're a person and it's okay. Sometimes things will never go back to what they were. Sometimes things won't feel the way that they did. So when it comes to things like trust between friends or sexual attraction between spouses or even laughter amongst coworkers in the workplace, those things can come back, but they're not necessary for reconciliation to have taken place. So we're not going to judge whether reconciliation is true and real based upon our feelings or on trust being like it was before or me looking at them the same way as I used to. No, that's something different. That's something that can happen, but that's not guaranteed to happen as we walk this out. Sometimes we get to peace and that's enough. It looks like, hey, You did this to me, we've addressed it, we're good now, but we're just not the same as it was anymore. There's no hostility, we're good. We can be in the same room, and you can tell we're good because we're not gossiping about each other. We're not harboring this unforgiveness, but it's just not what it used to be. And oftentimes, that is what the reconciliation looks like. So if you're hurt After reconciling, if you're still feeling the ugh, first give yourself a little bit of grace. You're a person, and it's okay. Also know that God can move in that. You can pray. God can restore those feelings. You can do that too. But it's not up to you to have to feel good in order for something to be real and for you to be walking out as God called you to walk out. You can have grace on yourself there. And also just an encouragement, know that God's going to comfort you in ways that you can't comfort yourself. He's called the comforter for a reason. He does things in those situations that mm, are better than anything we could do. That was a tough one. That was a deep one. Let's go to the next one. I don't think any of these are easy, except maybe that first question. That was good. Number four, what happens if two people sin against each other? Woo, another good question. This is so common. So this is so common because even if, let's say, person A sins against person B, how common is it that person B now sins because they've been victimized and they sin, do something bad? Anybody ever seen that one happen? (laughs) Yeah, so now we have... Victim that's become perpetrator and perpetrator that's become victim. Now we're both victims and we're both perpetrators. What happens when we both sinned against each other? Hello, this is basically all of life. Yeah? This is all of marriage. This is all of a friendship. I mean, like, you you mess up, you ask for forgiveness, you move forward. If you can't do this stuff, you don't move forward. You see what I'm saying? This is why this is real and it matters. What happens? when we're both victimizing each other. What do we do? Three simple things I'm going to give you. Number one, play your part. Number two, let them play their part. Number three, establish terms of reconciliation. It's things we've already talked about, but let's break it down. 
We've sinned against each other. What shall we do? Number one, play your part. That means forgive where you have been sinned against, even if they're not repenting. That's what we talked about the first two weeks of this series. Forgive. Now, repent for where you've sinned. Matthew chapter 5. Even if they're not forgiving you, repent anyway. That's your part. Play your part. That's your role, first and foremost. Number two, let them play their role. Now, if you want a relationship moving forward and you want reconciliation, you have to let them forgive you. They need to do that. You can't make them. They need to forgive you where they've sinned against you. And they need to repent. Wait, they need to forgive you where you've sinned against them. There we go. And you need to, they need to repent to you for wherever they have sinned against you. So now you're doing your part. They've done their part. Number three, you have to establish these terms of reconciliation, y'all. This is so often, again, go back and watch the prior messages. I spent a lot of time here because this is where we leave off. A lot of times we say, oh, I've apologized, you've apologized, we're both good, but we know it's not good. This is where talking through, what are we going to do to make sure we're good moving forward? Actually having that conversation. What's it take? Hey, what's it look like for us to move forward now? Because it's different. Just because you sinned against me and I sinned against you, it don't mean it's always equal. Like, you know, if I, I slap Adriana in the face and she slaps me back, then maybe that's equal. And we say, that was dumb. I'm sorry. Are we good? Okay, good. And we move forward. That's equal. But like, if I burned a book of your matches and you burned down my house, that's different. I'm not good saying, we both burned up some stuff. Let's move forward. There might need to be a conversation of, what does this look like? Now, Now I've sinned against you. I'm going to apologize. And you've sinned against me. You can apologize. Yeah, but we got to deal with some stuff. We can't just act like we're going to do the same stuff moving forward and everything's just fine and dandy. Having that conversation and laying out what does this look like for us to be good moving forward? How do we reconcile this? It's having that conversation. And even if you two can't come to an agreement, uh, that's doing, again, what we talked about last week in week five, briefly, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It talks about bringing in other believers. If you guys can't decide whose sin was worse or how much restitution you should pay and how much they should pay, bring in wise Christian counsel. There's a reason we have the body, y'all. We should lean on each other. It's not always wise to keep all of your issues in-house and not share them. That's how I've seen a lot of houses cease to be a house, and they split. Because they were too prideful to share anything that was bad in their life with anybody else. And pride will lead to your downfall. Or you could humble yourself and say, you know, we need some help here. Could you help us in this situation? Hey, I see that y'all's marriage is really solid. And I've known from what you've told me before, it wasn't always that way. How did y'all work through it? Could y'all give us some advice? Hey, I've seen that y'all are really close friends. I would love to have some close friends like that. I have no close friends in my life, even though I know a lot of people. It seems like we just get mad at each other all the time. Like, could you tell me something maybe I'm doing wrong here with these people in my life? Letting people speak into those places will bring you so much life. Will help you so much. So lean on the body. You can bring other people in. So you got to, do your part, let them do their part, establish those terms. Now, this follow-up question is really similar. That's why I put these two together. I love this. What to do when both parties believe they are the victim, but neither party will admit they are wrong? Ooh. Now, I know probably the person that asked this question is probably the only ones that experienced this, but we decided to answer it publicly anyway, so that if you ever come up against it, you're going to know what to do when you get there. All right, one more time. What to do when both parties believe they're the victim, but nobody's taking responsibility. Nobody's admitting, yeah, I was wrong. What do we do with that? Well, first, you need to establish some kind of groundwork for what's actually sin. 
you need to come to some sort of understanding for what defines right and wrong. What is sin? Now, as believers, what do we use for that? We use the Bible, the Word of God. We have a standard by which we measure sinful things and maybe just things that are preference issues, things that we can overlook. The Bible is what Christians use to define right and wrong. Have y'all heard that anywhere before? Yeah. As, as I say it so many times so I'm blue in the face because I just feel like we need to really get that one part. If we look at the Bible, we can know what God says and not just what we say or our coworkers say or our family says about what's right and wrong. So, first we've got to establish in this situation, because there's two people at odds. Two people think they're the victim, but nobody's saying they're wrong and nobody's owning it. First thing we got to do is define what is right and wrong. We go to the Bible. In my Bible, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25 says, Therefore, ridding yourselves of falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, because we are parts of one another. Now that we've established what's right and wrong, we must speak truthfully. So if we've done something, Christian, we own it. If we've not done anything, we don't have to own it. Just because there is a perception of wrong being done does not make you guilty. Now, I know this is not popular in this day and age, but just because somebody accuses you of doing something wrong doesn't mean you've actually done anything wrong. It's true. Sometimes people misperceive things. Sometimes there's misunderstandings. Sometimes, because it's their truth, doesn't actually make it the truth. A perception of wrong done does not necessarily equal wrong done. Amen? Yeah. Y'all remember that thing, like, innocent until proven guilty? That'd be a great thing to bring back. Just because somebody says it, don't make it true. Don't mean you can move on it and that you're justified in actions resulting from something that's just in somebody's mind. So once we've determined right and wrong, once we've determined what's actually gone down in reality, not just in somebody's mind subjectively because they said it was so, now we can even take one further step and we can start to differentiate between sinful things and, I said earlier, preference things. Lesser things, things that are matters of uh, opinion and preference. Because I'll say it like this How many of you know you can violate somebody's expectations without sinning against them? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? I mean, it happens all the time. If I opened the door for you and you walked through and you didn't say thank you, well, I would probably expect you to say thank you. I might think you're rude, but I would not think they have sinned against me. Wouldn't think that. There's a violation of expectation, but you've not sinned by being a rude person and walking in the door and not saying thank you. Maybe it's just because I was raised in the South. I don't know. Maybe they didn't teach y'all that up North. I don't know. I think you're rude, but you're not sinning. It's different. You can violate expectations in any realm because a lot of things are cultural like that or how your family raised you to do things or this is how it's done here. Maybe you didn't know. They're, they're those kind of things. Like I show up uh, in this part of the country. This happens a lot. I could, I could show up at um, your University of Tennessee watch party and be wearing my blue and white of my Kentucky Wildcats. Now, I may offend you. You may not like me for a minute. You may not look well upon my choice of colors. But have I sinned? No. I've not done anything inherently wrong. Nothing that the Bible defines as sinned. I'm just supporting the greatest basketball team ever in college sports. That's all I'm doing. I can't help it that your team's not as good, but there's another team, the University of North Carolina Tar Heels, got beat by the Kentucky Wildcats yesterday, yet again proving we're the best. Go Cats. But anyway... Not everybody can have the best team to root for. 
And I may violate your expectations, but I've not sinned in that, right? It's just a cultural thing. Now, in that situation, I might still apologize to you for violating an expectation, but I'm not going to have to repent for anything. I've not sinned. Do you see the difference here between what God says is right and wrong and then lesser things culturally that we just kind of would like to be our way? When you've not sinned, there's no need for you to repent for things. So when it comes to this situation, two people think they're both in the right. They feel like they're the victim. First, we got to, number one, what is right and wrong? Number two, what actually has happened? Let's have an honest conversation. And then number three, is that actually sin or is it something else? Then we can go through the process of, okay, who needs to repent now? Who needs to offer forgiveness? Who, how do we lay down these terms of reconciliation? But first, you have to go through those steps. I hope that was helpful. We got just a few more. Number six, what happens when you talk about terms of reconciliation and then the other person doesn't want to reconcile anymore? Real life. So you're actually trying to walk this out. Two people who say, yeah, we would love to still make this happen, whatever this is. But then we talk about what it's going to take, restitution, whatever. But then other party now doesn't want to go through with it. What do we do? Well, there's really only two options here. Number one, you negotiate the terms to where they're acceptable, or you can't reconcile the relationship. It's really that simple. You negotiate to where you both can agree upon what's acceptable or the relationship won't be salvaged. Now, I know that seems like just black and white, but again, that's kind of what it is in this one. Because you can pray. You can pray for God to change your heart. You can pray for God to change their heart. But at some point, you're going to have to make a decision. Are you moving forward and moving on? Or are you going to meet their terms? And you're going to negotiate down almost. You're going to meet them where they're at so you can have the relationship. Now, I don't know when this person asked this question if they actually define reconciliation the way we have in this series. I don't know if they, or if they view it more of how I used to think, like, oh, it's, it's going back to what it used to be. If we're going to reconcile, then we're exactly like we used to be. I feel like I used to. I don't know if they have that perception, because if they do, you still have to do this. You still have to establish terms, and then hope that it'll go back. But if they got in mind what we're talking about is reconciliation, meaning there is peace where there was hostility, there is now no longer this discord, but there's a cord, then you can actually still have this relationship, but it looks different moving forward. I'll say that a different way. You can move forward with your relationship, but now it takes a different form. So for example, best friends may reconcile, but they're not best friends anymore. They're friends. Boyfriend and girlfriend might have been dating for a while. They can reconcile, but they've realized we're not going to be boyfriend and girlfriend anymore. There's reconciliation. It's real. There's been forgiveness. There's been repentance. But in talking about how we move forward, ones might say, I, don't, I can't trust you again. Or I don't want to move forward like we were anymore. But there's still reconciliation, and you can still tell that it's real because, again, they're not talking bad about each other and spreading slander about each other. It hurts. They don't like how it wound up, but they've reconciled, just taken a different form moving forward. God's not calling you to receive every person that hurts you back into your life in the same capacity. That's not what the Bible says. There's one... Uh, I didn't feel like we had time. If I could go show you a whole other scripture, you can look in 1 Samuel 26 and 27 if you want to. In that encounter, you see David and Saul. This is after Saul has made multiple attempts on David's life over and over and over again. Again, David spares his life. Again. 
Saul says, I'm basically, this is my paraphrase at the end of chapter 26. Saul says, I'm so sorry. Come back to me. David basically says, may God judge between us and then goes his own way. David was in a relationship with a king that was not healthy. Saul wanted a relationship back. Did David take him up on it? No, he did not. He walked away. Chapter 27, he, it talks about how he goes on and he's like, I'm never going to get away from him for sure. I'm just going to hide out in this place and maybe he'll get tired of chasing me. And finally Saul does and David gets to live. I say all that to say reconciliation, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, best friends, God has not commanded you to go back to how things were. That may be a hard truth, but maybe it's what some of you need to hear. Especially when there's not forgiveness, repentance, and this reconciliation process happening. To go back to what things were might be really, really stupid. Woman gets beat up by her boyfriend. I'm a Christian. I think I should just go back to him with nothing changing. No, not wise. Where do we see a model of it? David and Saul. Biblically, there's wisdom in going through this process that we're modding biblically. Repentance, forgiveness, restitution. If you don't see these things, I wouldn't even consider going back to how things were. But even if you see these things, don't feel that you're required for everything to go back to how they were. Sometimes it's possible, and God does it. Y'all, I've heard crazy stories of renewal and restoration and these relationships that looked broken beyond repair. God putting them back together because both parties were willing and God did something supernatural. It happens all the time. But I don't want you to feel the weight of a burden that Scripture doesn't put on you. Scripture doesn't expect you in every situation to just make nice and endure abuse. It's not the Lord. That sounds like an abuse of Scripture or just a misunderstanding. Either way, <laughs> I don't know how to lighten it right now. That's a heavy topic. Either way, you don't have to feel the weight. We forgive, we repent, we do our part. And in this one, maybe reconciliation looks like, hey, we're just not going to be the same. But I got nothing against you now. If I see you in public, we're good. In private, I'm not talking bad about you, but we're reconciled. And God bless you. Which leads me to the very... Related next question, and this is why I love Scripture, because it's always like a both and. There's so much tension in the goodness of what God's given us. Do Christians have to reconcile? Somebody, I think, asked this one in our small group this week. Do Christians have to reconcile? Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24 again, quickly. It says, this is Jesus talking. If you are presenting your offering at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, what? Be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So Jesus here commands the offender to be reconciled. Now we went in depth on this in week three, so if you want to go back and see that again, go check it out. But the gist is this. There's so many things that Jesus commands here. He says, if you're doing this, if you're in worship and you remember something that your brother has against you, the commands are go, leave the offering, and then return, make the offering. But the one you cannot do on your own is the reconciliation. It must be offered to you by the one that you have victimized. In other words, it takes two parties for reconciliation. It only takes one for forgiveness. It only takes one for repentance. But reconciliation takes two 
parties. That's the gist of it. And Jesus instructs us. This is a command that he tells us to do here. But even so, can we make the other person forgive us? No. Can we make the other person repent when they've done something wrong? No. We can't make it happen. But what can we do? Our part. We can do our part. That's what we can do. I really think there's a reason in Scripture that we see in multiple places, forgive as God has forgiven you, but we do not see reconcile as God has reconciled with you. Why? Because forgiveness is totally up to us. One party. Reconciliation is not entirely up to us. We can be so willing I don't know about you, but I, even right now, I have a, a process I'm working through, and I'm hoping and praying this other individual will reconcile with me. Right now, we're not. And I can't make him do it. Can't make him. I want it so bad. I even hope and pray that things are like they were before. I want that so bad. But it's going to take two parties. And as much as I pray and pray for God to show him, hey, you messed up in this too. And as much as I want God to change my heart and soften it and us to be good, I can't make it happen. See, there's a difference when we're working with people. See, God's always a willing party to reconciliation. Hallelujah. Because if he wasn't, we'd be screwed. God's always willing. What's the Bible say? Confess, turn. He will forgive you. He will wipe the slate clean. Reconciliation happens when hostility is made into peace. Jesus has already done it. So now all it takes on our end to be good with a righteous and perfect holy God is to accept what Jesus has done. The hostility he's already taken care of. God is a willing recipient for reconciliation. Turn, repent, confess, you will be right with God. People are not always willing. I can't make you reconcile with me. I couldn't make God do it, but he initiated towards us. Jesus shed his blood so that we could have forgiveness of sins, so that we can now have peace with a perfect father, so that we could be reconciled to God. But sometimes when I go to my friend and I want to reconcile, he is unwilling. I can't make him. And it's a reality we got to deal with. But that being said, should we attempt reconciliation as much as possible? I think absolutely. Remember, reconciliation is just putting peace where there was hostility. It does not mean perfect. It does not mean my feelings are back. Reconciliation means now it's whole. Now there's peace. In Matthew chapter 5 right here, in the whole of Scripture, I personally see as pointing to us as Christians have a responsibility as sons of God to reconcile whenever possible. That is what we are called to do. Two more and we'll wrap up. Are we called to reconcile with non-Christians? So this would be like, the person asking this might be like, well, that prior verse said reconcile with your brother. But they didn't say people that don't love Jesus. I'm off the hook with them, right? I ain't got to forgive them, right? Well, I'll ask some questions to you, and maybe you'll come to an answer. Would God want you to forgive a non-Christian when they wrong you? <laughs> Would God want you to repent to a non-Christian when you wrong them? Would God want you to be at peace whenever possible with non-Christians or to have hostility whenever you want with non-Christians? I feel like he would want you to be at peace whenever possible with non-Christians. Now, where would I get that opinion? From the Bible. Romans chapter 12, 18. Y'all remember this one from last week? If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. 
I love how this verse even specifies all people. You know what all means? All. It means all those people, the ones you don't want to be at peace with. The ones that somehow in the back of your mind, you maybe still think that you're better than. The ones that you're like, I sin, but I don't do what they do. That's who you're supposed to be at peace with. The ones who make fun of the Lord, who have no grid for Christianity, who are atheists, who are worshiping, uh, I won't go through all that, who are just not Christians. God says, here's my word. I give it to you to implement. Now, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. It literally says all people. It doesn't say brethren. It doesn't say brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, does this mean we approve of sin? No. Does it mean that we join with worldly things where it's not lining up with the word of God just so that they'll be happy with us and we're peaceful with them? No. We still stand on the word. We still do what God says. But when we're actually living this out, y'all, when we are actively forgiving, repenting, trying to reconcile in every way that we possibly can, we are shining like lights in the darkness. We are modeling to the world the love that God has given us. When we walk this out, ladies and gentlemen, when we make peace, where the world doesn't expect it, it makes a world that is in their own pride and in their own pain stand up and take notice. Something's different about you. When somebody wrongs you that's a non-Christian, you know what they expect back? To be wronged. If they hurt you, they expect you to hurt them back. Tit for tat. It's what's expected. When we, if at all possible, forgive and repent and try to reconcile with somebody who doesn't know Jesus, you know what we're modeling? The love that we've been shown. We are reconciled with a perfect God. Therefore, we try to reconcile, if at all possible, with all people. All people. Now, it may be harder to reconcile with somebody who don't love Jesus because they're probably not going to have the same grid as you for what right and wrong even is and what needs to happen when they've messed you over or you've done something to them. They're not going to have the same thoughts about it, so it might indeed be harder. However, Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Mm. All right, last one for the day. We'll wrap up. Can we ever stop trying to reconcile? So this is the, Adam, I've tried this. It didn't work. Can I just give up? Is there ever a point at which, as Christians, we can say, I've tried hard enough. It's in their court now. I don't have to do anything else. My opinion I think once you've done everything possible, then you can be at rest. Now, you know, I don't know, if you've done everything possible. We can have a conversation, and it might be the whole conversation. You're just trying to justify to yourself out loud that you've done everything possible and tell me about it, but you know deep down in your heart there's just something in there like, I don't, I'm just going to try to feel like I don't need to. I don't know. God knows that. You probably know that. I don't know that. But if you've done all things that you possibly can, you've forgiven, you've repented, you've tried to establish these terms of reconciliation, the other party is just not having it, I think, yes, you can be at rest. Absolutely. Don't carry the burden. You don't have to feel the weight of something that you can't make another person do with you. Now, that being said, if they come back to the table, like let's say you tried to reconcile, didn't work, and they return to you in a year and want to go back down that road, should you do it? I think so. I think it's our responsibility as Christians to, if possible, as far as it depends on me, try to be at peace with you. There's hostility now. Well, I'm going to do what I can to be at peace with you, even if it's a year later, two years later, 10 years later. But again, if you go through the motions, oh, okay, let's repent. 
Let's define what's right and wrong. Let's forgive. Let's establish terms. If it doesn't work, you've done everything you can, feel free. Feel free. Don't feel weight that's not yours to carry. But if they come back, here it is again. It's over and over and over again. Just like God is always waiting for you to return to him, I think we need to be willing and ready to reconcile when somebody wants it to happen with us. We are to be like our Savior, not like the world, not calloused, not shut off. I'm, I'm scared to get hurt again. I'll never trust anybody again. I'll never love anybody again. That's what the world says. And it'll leave you more bitter and worse off than you are now. God says, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to walk with you. Let's do this together. That's our model. And it's not a popular thing to talk about. That's why in all of my years in Christendom, I've never heard a series on reconciliation and going deep into it like this, restitution. Talking about this in the depth that it is, is one of the hardest things I've ever had to address in a pulpit. I can talk about sin in the world all day. They can just hate me. This gets church folk mad at me. Because it's hard. (laughs) Because it is not easy. But if you do it, it will change your life. That is from the word. So I can't say it's my gift to you. It's, It's God's gift. He wants this for you. He wants a better life than what you see modeled by the world around you. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, no forgiveness, cancel culture. That's not God's will for you. God's will for you is to love him and love others like he's loved us. It's a tall order, y'all. But when you walk into it, I'm telling you, it will change your life. Not that I'm perfect in it. Ask Chelsea. We reconcile often. But trying it, walking it out, it will will just do things in you. I hope that answering these, I think it was nine questions, has been helpful. I hope it's given some practical advice and encouraged you because the goal, again, is to walk this out. It's to not leave it here, but to literally put feet to this. And it's encouraged you. Because even since the start of this message series, let me tell you, I'm proud of you guys because I'm already hearing stories of how you guys are doing it. There's been one person in our congregation who forgave somebody very close to them where they were harboring unforgiveness for a while. And that person now feels free and doesn't feel the weight that they were carrying around. Praise the Lord. Amazing. So good. (laughs) Like three of y'all thought that was really awesome. Make it four. I think it's awesome too. Another person um, has been processing through their emotions, much like the question we had, because they made a decision, and a decision they made kind of came back to bite them. It wasn't their fault. They got put on the hook monetarily for something that wasn't their fault. But they've been working through what those feelings are like and then starting to realize how they can still have a relationship with the person that put them in the bad position walking it out in a real way. Another person uh, told, told me about, they called up an old friend of theirs, talked to him on the phone, hadn't talked to him in forever, started just apologizing for things that he had done a while back. And then the person on the other end starts apologizing for things he did a while back. And now these guys are not estranged anymore. They both forgiven each other. They're moving forward. Like, God is moving, y'all. God is doing this stuff. He is into forgiveness and reconciliation. And it's working in y'all's lives. And that's just a few of the stories. I'm praying he continues to do it. I'm praying that as we walk this out, these stories keep happening as not just in this Christmas season, when how many of you know, sometimes the hardest people to do this with is the closest with close friends and family. But it can happen. It's going to take you maybe initiating it, but I'm praying that God's going to continue to do what only he can do 
as we're faithful to do what we can do, which is forgive and repent and reconcile. God's going to do it, y'all. God's going to do it. Let's go do our part. Amen.